Oh, that was supposed to go here first. My bad. I'll edit this out. And um, also, I want to ask everybody to mute. You can unmute to ask questions, but just for the background noise, please. Tijome. There we go. Okay. Can everybody see the screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hey. <clears throat> so tonight we're starting a whole new quarter. <clears throat> Um, in case you guys haven't noticed, this year is going by really super fast. And it seems like we started this back in January yesterday. We've come a long way with a lot of history on our peoples and the things and events that were happening that involved our peoples. And we have finally worked our way up to one that most everybody is very familiar with, in Chief Tarhe. So... This is the beginning of our third quarter. And talking with Kim before everybody got online, we're gonna to have to change things a little bit. And next month, we're gonna do kind of a continuation of part two of Tarhe. Otherwise, we would end up being here till probably about 10 o'clock, uh, talking uh, central time, talking about all the stuff that we could talk about Tarhe, because if anybody isn't really familiar with him, he was. Phenomenal. So we're going to jump right in here, take a look at our objectives, <clears throat> which are pretty basic. We're going to see how Tarhe was just an average man. And we're going to take a look at the legend that he became and the necessary leader that we needed at the time when he was chief. Before we go too far, <clears throat> we need to make a disclaimer. Um, when you start looking at individuals such as Tarhe, who was very prominent, very well noted, and known by a lot of people, there are many, many, many contradictions from historians and authors and publications regarding historical materials relevant with Tarhe, uh, events and things that he participated in. Um, you have to be very, very careful when you start reading out there because there is a lot of really bad information. Uh, things very, um, very well publicized, such as the fact that a lot of people for years and years and years and years believe that Tarhe was the one that killed Leather Lips. So we have to be very careful when we start looking at all this information to make sure that we can cross check and double check and have multiple sources to verify information because it's it's a mess and individuals such as Tarhe were they were embellished uh, information about them was distorted there was a lot of mistruths about them uh, because people even though the Indians in the the far west were feared and despised they were also romanticized uh, anything relevant to the Indians uh, was often craved and coveted by the Americans and not only the Americans but uh, the Europeans, where they were just mesmerized by what was going on in, in the United States. And the more that an individual such as Tarhe could be embellished and made into some form of a monster in, in many cases, the more money could be made off the stories that were written and published about him. So I just ever, I want everybody to know that uh, there can be some information that might be different that I'm sharing that from what you have, um, I will provide all the sources and hopefully much of what we have here lines up with what everybody believes because there's just so many different things out there that come up different when you look at somebody as, as grandiose as Tarhe. So I like to start off with this quote from uh, James B. Finley. And it kind of sets the stage for the average man that Tarhe actually was. And James B. Finley in Life Among the Indians uh, said, among the greatest chiefs of the Northwest, there was none greater than Tarhe or the Crane. He was head chief of the Wyandotte Nation and belonged to the Porcupine tribe. He was always cool, deliberate, and firm. 
His wisdom in counsel, as well as his bravely, bravery in war, gave him great influence among the neighboring tribes. And when you get out there and you start looking at individuals that have written about Tarhe, and you can be trustful of who the men are and what they're saying, everybody out there has the same type of, of compliments and accolades of, of Tarhe. Uh, back in the day, his influence and his respect that he commanded among not only the other nations, but also the Americans and the Europeans was unparalleled. When you start looking for Tarhe in the history books, you have to look at a lot of different names. All of us are familiar with Tarhe. I can remember it's not been too awful long ago uh, when we really started. It's coming up 20 years next, next year when we actually started the gathering and and pulling together all this information and sharing it with our citizens. I can remember it was not that long ago that when we would talk about Tarhe, guess what we called him? We called him Tarhe. So even something as simple as correctly pronouncing his name is it's a big thing for us. So Tarhe, um, it's easy to mispronounce his name when you see the next one, Tarhe, um, Tarke. Tike, Tiki, the crane, La Gru, La Chief La Gru, and Monsieur Gru. There's many different names that he was known by, and being able to identify the names that he went by and the names that he was identified by is very important when you start looking for him because many, many times you just don't see the name Tarhe out there. So, Tarhe, what we're going to look at tonight <clears throat> is going to be a kind of a, an establishment of who the man was. Um, give a little bit of background as to who he was and where he came from and some of his initial achievements. And then next week, we're going to look at more, uh, what he was actually responsible for and, and, and the greatness that he actually became. So tonight, we're just looking at, basically, he was born in Detroit, somewhere around Detroit. And it's generally believed that Tarhe was born somewhere around the year of 1743 to 1745. Uh, we don't know a specific year on his birth, but when you look at things that he's done in coming years, uh, we can kind of piece together uh, when it's generally believed that he was born. So 1743 to 45 is a nice little span there when he most likely was born in the area of Detroit. We do know that Tarhe was a porcupine. He came from the porcupine clan. And Tarhe was not his clan name. Uh, we do not know Tarhe's clan name. And the, the interesting thing about Ty, Tarhe is at the time of his birth, um, there was nothing special about him. He was just a, another citizen that was born. Uh, he was born of a regular family that wasn't involved with any politics or anything that was going on. He was just an, an average citizen born into an average citizen family. Uh, Tarhe was just a, destined to be another tribal warrior because he was a porcupine and porcupine supplied a lot of warriors to the nation. But as Tarhe began to grow into a young man, uh, he began to stand out heads over shoulders uh, over his peers. Something was uniquely different about him that began to catch the attention of a lot of people, uh, not only those within his clan, but within the nation and the nations around him. Tarhe was just standing out to be different, and he was not such an ordinary man as what most people believed him to be. Tarhe? He was tall, and that began to impress a lot of people. Back in the day, uh, it's believed that Tarhe was at least uh, six feet, four inches tall. And at that time, most men barely made it to five foot six, five foot eight. Uh, that was kind of the average height of most men, including the, um, the, the men within the various nations. And he being six foot four inches tall, he just towered above most of the people that he was around. And Tarhe 
evidently is a name that was given to him or he had chosen it for himself. The true meaning of Tarhe is not really known, but it's believed that the name Tarhe is referencing a pine tree because the pine tree, as you can see there, the, the picture of the tree that I, I chose often towered above all the other trees of the forest. And Tarhe, um, the tree was a good reference for him because he was tall, slender, um, most likely he had a very athletic athletic build. And to embarrass Mr. Garcia just a little bit, if everybody can take a moment and just picture Josh, uh, he's tall, uh, he's slender, he's athletic. Uh, he stands out whenever he's around most of the people that, that are in Wyandotte and come to the gathering. Josh, is he just stands out uh, because he's taller than most of us. Plus, he carries himself very well. And if you can picture Josh, picture that as being Tarhe. And we don't want to make Josh into Tarhe or anything like that. But just for, for an example, uh, Josh would have been that type of a person that would have been seen in Tarhe. So the French named Tarhe Le Gru. Um, a frequent addition was Mr. Gru. And the English picked up on that uh, French name. And they simply referred to Tarhe as the crane. And the crane was actually a fairly good designation and description of who Tarhe was because the whooping crane, which is what he was named by, is or named after, is the tallest bird on the Great Island. And the whooping crane uh, stands about five feet tall. So the, the nickname, if you will, that was given to Tarhe and who he is frequently referred to as being, uh, the crane was actually a very fitting. A uh, name for him to have carried. So there's little that's known about Tarhe's childhood. Uh, Tarhe would have been raised like all other Huron Wyandotte boys. Uh, he was taught by his clan chief in the arts of war. Uh, the clan chief had the responsibility of teaching all of his citizens, uh, the males only, uh, how to actually participate in war, how to to, to do strategy and, and everything that was associated with war. The clan chief was the one who had that responsibility and there were other chiefs below him uh, that would have helped in that task. Uh, since Tarhe was a porcupine, he was expected to know how to stand and fight. Uh, as a child, Tarhe would have been proficient in the chase of both man and beast of the forest. Uh, it's believed, we've, we mentioned this last month, I believe, it's believed that at 10 to 12 years old, on July 9th of 1755, Tarhe fought in his first battle as a Wyandotte warrior, and he fought the British at the Battle of the Mongahela. There was a tradition among the tribe that the, the males could only go to war when they were 10 years old. That was the earliest that a male could actually take to the, take to the field and, and go and actual uh, participate in hand-to-hand -hand combat. 10 years old today for us is considered incredibly young to actually expect a, a child uh, to take a weapon and go out there and fight to defend the nation, to defend the traditions, to defend the homeland. But back then, 10 years old, uh, Tarhe would have been a proficient warrior. He would have been a proficient hunter at that young age. And as we saw um, last week and then earlier last month, uh, Tarhe, known as Takei in 1763, is the one that actually led the Huron Wyandotte warriors that supported uh, Chief Pontiac during his uprising at Detroit. So, within a very short amount of time, Tarhe became Noted as a warrior, but Tarhe or the Crane was not noted as a warrior. Uh, that is a quote from William Walker Jr., uh, July of 1868, whenever he was making a lot of his uh, knowledge known to uh, Mr. Draper. Uh, Tarhe was identified by William Walker Jr. as just, again, being an average man, being an average warrior. Uh, within the tribe. And whenever you understand that we had many, many, many warriors 
uh, that stood out, uh, Tarhe was just another warrior. He was nothing special. Uh, by birthright, as a porcupine, Tarhe could have been the tribe's war pole. The war pole was the head chief of the tribe. And the clan chief, uh, each one of them would have had their own war chiefs that were below them. So there were possible uh, routes for Tarhe to have served as a, a war chief within the porcupine clan or as a war chief within the Wyandot tribe or as the war pole, because only a porcupine, a snake, and a deer clan citizen could have served as war pole. But Tarhe never served as war pole, and he never was noted as being a war chief of the porcupine clan. Um, that makes you want to stop and wonder why was he actually so influential and capable of actually organizing and bringing to the support of Chief Pontiac uh, half of the warriors that were there at Detroit. What about him stood out that they were willing to, to follow him and fight beside him when he was not a chief? Uh, Tarhe was just an average warrior, and we got to look here pretty deep, more so tomorrow, or not tomorrow, but next month, as to what made him so special. So throughout the Revolutionary War, since Tarhe was not a war chief, it was Rotunda, Rotundi, uh, who served as Don Quat's war pole. Uh, Rotunda, Rotundi, uh, was a porcupine. Uh, he was described by William Walker Jr. as being restless. He was headstrong. He was an arbitrary man which in many ways fits a lot of the porcupines out there. They were just uh, people that sometimes were just a little hard to get along with. And Rotundi, uh, Rontundi, uh, was that man. He was the, the war pole of the tribe during the Revolutionary War, and he got into a massive disagreement with Dionquat. And he led the porcupine band that he was uh, leading away from Dionquat. And they went up into the uh, area of what is today the Cleveland, Ohio, up in the far northeastern corner of Indian country, uh, the, the Ohio country. So Don Quat basically lost his war pole uh, to a man who had a hard time controlling his temper. And he eventually settled in the area around Fort Wayne um, in what is now the state of Indiana. After Rotundi's death, uh, his band returned to the tribe somewhere around 1800. So that right there can tell you that the porcupines can be difficult to live with sometimes. And whenever uh, Rotundi uh, basically vacated the tribe, he just up and left, a adopted white man by the name of Abraham Kuhn uh, basically stood up in his place and became a very influential war chief. He was never really recognized as the war pole. He couldn't be the actual war pole because he was an adopted white man. Uh, he was Prussian, uh, but he became the influential war chief to basically end what became the time period in which the American Revolution came to a conclusion. And if you look at the history books, the name Kuhn, Abraham Kuhn, um, became um, spelled differently in time. Uh, the family name, the lineage of Abraham Kuhn became known as the Kuhns. Uh, spelt C-O-O-N, and that name became very prominent and prevalent within the tribe. So remember, uh, this is some stuff to remember for next month. Uh, Dionquat, Tarhe's predecessor, can't be confused with Dionquat, Tarhe's successor. We talked about that last week. And also, uh, to more toward uh, next quarter, uh, Rotundi, uh, the Wyandots war pole during the American Revolution, Revolution we cannot con confuse him with another rotundi uh, that basically serves as the last war pole of the tribe. Um, in 1828, when the office of war pole was abolished, uh, rotundi assumed the name of war pole. And we'll see that name play out again as we talk more uh, in coming discussions. But there is also another problem that we have. We see that we have some of our citizens that bore names that were very similar. 
and some of our citizens bore names that were identical because the clan names, when they were used by a citizen and that citizen died, that name went back into the clan, the clan's list of names, and they could be used over and over and over again. And during this time that we're talking about, we had a lot of attrition within the tribe. A lot of our citizens were killed in the battles. So like with Rotundi, uh, we see the name being used over a period of time where more than one man bore the same name, but it's not the same man. Uh, Tarhe was appointed to the Wyandotte Tribal Council by Dionquat. Um, Tarhe became a leading man. Tarhe did not have the heritage to actually set on the tribal council. Uh, he did not have that generational passing from um, uncle to nephew that he could have actually have set on the council as a chief. But he was noted by Donquat as being different. And Donquat actually established him on the tribal council as a leading man. And the leading men were considered advisors to the head chief. So Donquat saw something there that caught his attention that he wanted Tarhe by his side. In time, the Huron Wyandotte leading men became a leading cause of the decline of the clans and the clan mothers. And fortunately for us, talking about uh, Tarhe, Tarhe was serving as a leading man before that decline. Became, began to cause some, some horrible decline within the clans. So Don Quat, uh, the Wyandotte's great half-king that we talked a little bit about last week, uh, he died in 1788. After the death of Don Quat, who was a powerful chief, he was a chief that basically commanded all the different nations and had victory over the colonial Americans. The colonial Americans defeated the British Empire, but the Indians defeated the colonial Americans. Uh, we don't see a lot of that in the history books. And Donquat was the, the, the half king. He was the chief that led that, that defeat of the colonials. And when Donquat died, um, what happened next had never, ever happened before in the history of the nation that we're aware of. Uh, there was a tradition within the nation that had never been used before that we are aware of. And after the death of Dionquat, this tradition had to be used and it was brought into play very quickly because there was a lesser chief from the area of Detroit by the name of Isidore Sheen. Um, Isidore claimed to be Dionquat's successor. Uh, he was a citizen of the Deer Clan, which gave him the right to become the next head chief. And his mother had a relationship. Uh, somehow he was she was related to Donquat, which Isidore played upon and even tried to position himself uh, even deeper into the, the sentiments of the tribal council that would have the clan council that would select the next head chief. But unfortunately for Isidore, by this time, there was a tribal law that had been enacted. And it stated that the head chief of the tribe had to be a pure blood Wyandotte. Isidore's father was a Frenchman from Lorette. Uh, it was determined by the tribal council that Isidore Sheen was not Wyandotte, he was actually Wendat. So even though he was from the Deer Clan, even though he had a relationship that established him somehow related to Donquat, because he was identified and, and basically brought to be known as being a Wendat, he was no longer eligible to serve as head chief. The tribal council looked around, they could not find any other good candidate from within the, the Deer Clan. So they invoked this tradition that had never been used before. And they appointed a highly respected leading man from the Porcupine Clan named Tarhe as the next head chief of the Wyandotte tribe. That had never happened before. There had never been a porcupine citizen who had served by appointment or any other means as head chief of the tribe. This was a huge shift in tradition within the Wyandotte nation. And it caused some, some issues. It caused some sentiments 
to actually cause a little bit of a rift between citizens in the Detroit area and citizens that were living down in the area of Sandusky. So traditionally, the porcupine served as war pole. Now you have the porcupines who are serving both as war pole and as head chief of the tribe. Only the porcupines and the snakes could ever serve as a war pole. Now um, we can see why the porcupines uh, and the snakes never served as a head chief because as we saw earlier with Rotundi, uh, they were often restless, headstrong and arbitrary men that did not do well with politics. And unfortunately for the tribe, uh, this described too many of the porcupine citizens to the point that they were never, ever, 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 ever considered to be a candidate for a head chief. But Tarhe was different. Even though he was just an average guy, he was different. And William Henry Harrison in the Hesperian, first volume of it when it was produced or published, uh, said this about Tarhe when he came to Tarhe's defense, because Tarhe in the same publication was branded as being the assassin of Leatherlips. And William Henry Harrison, who would go to serve as the ninth president of the United States, said this about Tarhe. I knew Tarhe well. My acquaintance with him commenced at the Treaty of Grenville in 1795. Tarhe was not only the grand session of the tribe, but the acknowledged head of all the tribes who were engaged in the war with the United States which was terminated by the Treaty of Grenville. So here we have a president of the United States of America who is standing up and acknowledging Tarhe for his greatness and for the role that he played as a combatant against the United States. Not many chiefs got that type of recognition. And this is why Tarhe uh, was a prime and excellent candidate to be chief of the tribe because he was not restless. He was not headstrong. He was not arbitrary in any way whatsoever. Uh, Tarhe, when he was chosen as head chief, was the type of man who probably refused, but he could not refuse the appointment from the tribal council. And in, at this time in the history of the tribe, uh, the Wyandotte people needed, needed a head chief like Tarhe. Uh, we had just had one of the most dominant, one of the most powerful, one of the most militaristic head chiefs that had ever served any nation uh, at the time of these battles that were taking place in the Ohio country. Uh, Don Quat was phenomenal in his ability to actually raise an army and put an army out there against uh, whatever would be brought against him. Tarhe now needed to serve in a different role. He needed to be a diplomat. He also needed to be a person who people would follow and recognize and, and be willing to put everything that they had into his care and his concerns. But yet at the same time, as we have seen, Tarhe was capable of leading men into battle, even though he was not a head chief. So Tarhe is serving in a totally different role now that no other chief has ever played. Tarhe was strong, he was firm, and he was intolerant when he needed to be. Um, never forget that Tarhe was a porcupine, and porcupines were raised to be warriors, as were all citizens of every single clan that we had. But the porcupines took it a little bit differently uh, because they were the ones who most often served as war pole. We'll see here a little bit later that the uh, state clan actually took over that role. But Tarhe was the consummate diplomat. Uh, his physical stature commanded respect. Everybody, when he was in their company, literally had to look up to Tarhe. Uh, Tarhe was a likable man by all the different tribes, all the different citizens of the nations, and the whites alike. Uh, Tarhe employed cunning wisdom over arbitrary feelings. Unlike most chiefs of his time, Tarhe knew that Resisting the Americans would end in destruction of the people of any nation that tried to go toe to toe with the Americans would suffer intolerable defeat. And Tarhe was unwilling to allow that to happen to his people. So should the Wyandots care? Should we today care what the United States government thinks? 
Yes, we should. Uh, Tarhe did back in his day, and Wyandotte should do the same today. It's called wisdom. Tarhe did build his palisades of isolationism. He did not taunt the government officials to come and tear them down. So Tarhe was an incredible warrior. He, he fought toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Americans. But as we will see next month, when it came time for him to, to recognize that he could no longer fight uh, and win the battles, uh, he was willing to find a way that he, that he could actually uh, form a relationship with the government and not cause them to come after him. But unfortunately, the policies of the United States government did not care. Oh, I didn't capitalize that. He did not, they did not care whether or not the, the nations were willing to be cooperative in their relationship with the uh, United States. They had this uh, feeling that they were going to defeat the tribes and remove them, whatever uh, the tribes thought of the government. And Tarhe didn't see that coming when he was chief at the time. Tarhe settled into a good but stressful life as the Wyandotte head chief and husband. Uh, Tarhe's first mate, um, there's not a lot known about her. Um, when you start looking at her, there's a lot of contradictions when you start looking at, at the, the mother of Myrina. Uh, she's commonly seen in the history books as Katie Sage. Uh, it's believed that Katie was, a, was likely a French-Canadian woman from the Durant family. Uh, she was adopted into the tribe. Uh, Tarhe took a liking to her, and he took her as his mate. Um, but it doesn't appear that they were together for very long. Uh, Tarhe and Katie separated, um, and there's little that's known of her from that point on one, onward. Myrina, uh, for herself, um, their daughter, she became the subject of legend. Uh, there is so much that has been written about her. Books have been written about her. Um, she's called the, um, the princess of the tribe, which we didn't have princesses in that respect. But the daughter of Tarhe and Katie Sage became legend within her own. And what happened with Katie? Don't know. Uh, Tarhe's second mate was Sally Sharp. Uh, she was also another white captive that was taken from the area around Greenbrier, Virginia. Uh, she was taken captive somewhere around 1782, and it's most likely that she was two years old at the time. So by the time that Sally and Tarhe had a child, they had a son. And William Walker Jr. described uh, their son as being demented and hairless. And he died at an early age, which that kind of gives us an idea that he's had some type of a, 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 a probably a criminal disease that, that caused him to not really develop. Um, but they had one son, and he died soon after, after he was a young child. Uh, after the death of Tarhe, uh, Sally uh, became the mate of Between the Logs. And we'll talk a little bit about Between the Logs a little bit later. Uh, but Tarhe had two mates. Uh, both of them were uh, women from European descent who were taken captive by the tribe. And he moved a lot with his family. Tarhe, as chief, had to move a lot because a lot of people loved him. A lot of people adored him. But the same number of people that thought so highly and respectful of Chief Tarhe, uh, there were an equal number of people that despised him because he stood in later in life as a friend and an ally of the United States. And because of that, uh, Tarhe was a target. Tarhe had to move around a lot to keep a lot of people unknowing of, of where he was located. Uh, Tarhe lived in Lancaster, Columbus, Solomonstown, Zanesfield, Sandusky, and eventually uh, he died in a town that took his name, Cranetown, which is just a little bit north of Upper Sandusky. So, the necessary leader. Uh, he became that necessary leader that the tribe had because what was happening at this particular point in history uh, was incredibly complicated. Uh, we have just come out of the time in which the uh, French and Indian War had concluded. We came out of the time where 
Uh, Pontiac and his uprising uh, went on for uh, comfortably three years. So there was a lot happening on the Great Island. The Europeans and the 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 the, the natives, the the different tribes, were at constant warfare. Uh, the colonials were now at the point of rebelling against Great Britain. So there was a lot happening, and Tarhe stepped in right at the end of the Revolutionary War, and became the necessary leader that next month we're going to look a little bit deeper into uh, Tarhe's war and his peace. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that Tarhe was the warrior. He was a lot like Don Quat. He was the leader of the rebellion um, that took place, the war that took place with the United States at the birth of the country. And Tarhe is not well known for the war that he fought there, but he is well known for the war, uh, for the peace that he achieved. And next month, we're going to take a look at a lot of that and a little different ending because, again, Tarhe was phenomenal. So is everybody aware that the United States military named a helicopter after our chief? Um, Tarhe, the Sky Crane, uh, bore the name, uh, this helicopter bore the name of our chief, the great Tarhe, um, was given his name to a helicopter. It's kind of weird, but yet at the same time, it's kind of cool. And as usual, and I've got some more sources I'm going to add to this. Um, that's all. Any thoughts, questions, comments? Uh, anybody knows some information here that could be shared? Um, yes. Uh, what we see there, uh, the, the spelling of the name, um, the R and the Y, the different spellings, uh, the different characters uh, is, is often seen out there. So the R and the Y on the spelling of her name there, that is the same person, uh, just spelled differently. Yep, they use those helicopters still today out on the the West Coast to help fight the uh, the fires. They are still in service all the way from the Vietnam War. And Yao yeah, Gru in French is crane, which is what the the British basically picked up in in English. Uh, Le Gru, uh, the crane, uh, Mister Crane is what he was often referred to. So anybody got any comments? Chief, you look a little confused there. Well, Ron Yonquin was Mayura's mother, not Yoronquin. Yeah, again. Yoronquin Yo was Sally Sage. Oh. And she is buried in Quindaro Cemetery on Parallel. Yeah, well, I knew that she was buried there. Mm -hmm. But Yoronquin, that's, that's Sally? Right. <laughs> okay, that I did not know. Mm -hmm. And Ron Yonquin. Actually, there is, um, Jan had done a lot of research with a guy up in Canada on Ron Yonquin. And he says that, and he's pretty sure it's true, that she is the daughter of a French man and a Wyandotte woman. Mm -hmm. And that's why he recognized his daughter because she, but she was Wyandotte. She was in a Wyandotte tribe. Correct. Yeah, there, there's a lot of speculation that that French connection mm -hmm. uh, was in a very prevalent, very influential family of French descent. So yeah. she was identified by her family at some point in time. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but like most of the citizens that were actually brought into the nation, and adopted, she, like most, especially the women, they chose to stay, she chose to stay in the tribe. She was given an opportunity to go back and she chose to stay in the tribe where she had been adopted and raised in. And that that is a compliment to the tribe that the women uh, who were adopted into the tribe and found a position within the tribe chose to stay rather than go back to the Europeans that they came out of. Uh, because our men, and there's some examples where our men were not nice to the women, mm -hmm. but our our women were treated with 
more respect and they were given more honor and recognition. Uh, the adopted women had a, a greater chance to actually fit into society and play a role uh, to fulfill their, their talents and their destinies far beyond what the European men would have allowed them if they would have gone back to their birth families. So the women stayed uh, with the tribe when they were given opportunities to go back. They just didn't want to go back to what would have been a difficult time. Um, did I see somebody? That's me. This is yeah. easy. Um, I read somewhere, and please correct me if I don't have this right, anybody in the room, that um, Ronyon Kwan's father, uh, uh, La Durant was um, a chevre, which is a Chevalier. category of of a particular rank in the military. I don't remember where it fits in, but it's fairly high ranking. Mm -hmm. And um, I I also read someplace. I I think I read. It's been a while now that she lived longer than Myra. I I might be wrong about that. Mm -mm. Yeah. She did not. I, I don't think so. Okay. I'll, I'll, I I I could be mixing up my my um, the mother and the stepmother. So after yeah. she, after she and Tarhe split for whatever reason, we don't know if if she set him aside or if he set her aside. If she died, we just don't know what happened to her. Um, but there is nothing in the historical record that I've been able to find that shows that she lived much beyond the time in which uh, Myrina became um, a Zane. She married into the Zane family. So to for her to have outlived Sally, I, I don't think that she did. I think that she probably ended up dying um, personally. I think she ended up dying shortly after her and Tarhe split or she died and that's what caused uh, obviously Tarhe to lose his mate. But something there, obviously happened and it was um pretty pretty great uh, she did not she did not outlive sally stand up okay the books uh about kate of uh, sally sage or <laughs> yeah. okay the book about her and i have met the um a relative of the Sage family. And their story is that um, Tarhe pulled her in as a family member and she took care of Ron Yonquin when before as she was dying. Hmm. So I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not, but you know, if you look at how some of the, the captives, if we dare call them a captive, because many of them, they, they were never captives. We never had any captives or slaves. They, they chose to stay or they went back. Right. So to, to call any of our citizens a captive, that's it's just a, a bad choice of words. But if you look at how a lot of people were brought into the tribe, they were brought into the tribe for a specific purpose, a specific need. And that actually makes sense, Chief for her to have been brought into the tribe, uh, maybe not as, as young of two years old, but she had been in the tribe and she had been identified by Tarhe and brought into the family for that purpose of taking care of her. Mm -hmm. And it would not be surprising for us to kind of look into that a little bit and see how she took care, uh, great care before she died. And Tarhe was probably deeply appreciative of that. And the way that he saw um, uh, his mate being taken care of, uh, it probably led him to look very favorably upon Katie and decide, I want her because of what she had just done for, for his mate. So that makes sense, Chief. I like that. Okay. Any more thoughts and comments? This is a good talk, guys. I like this. <laughs> We're learning stuff. All of us are. Any more thoughts? Well, I just want to say I didn't get to the last one. Could you send me the slides for that? Because, yeah. 
I don't know what happened that day, but I couldn't find them on the website or on the YouTube. Um, or Pontiac. I, 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 yeah. Um, I don't know when Cam or Josh actually post them, but yeah, I will send them directly to you, Chief. Thank you. I appreciate it. Lloyd, could I get a, a copy as well? Um, do I have your email address? Let me uh, take a look here. Okay. I know I've got your phone number. I don't know if I have an email address. If you want, just um, if you don't, you, you have my phone number, don't you? Yes, I'm about to text you now. Yep, that would be great. Text it to me and I will send it to you when I send it also to Chief. I appreciate that. So next month, when we talk more about Tarhe, and I just want everybody to be ready because we're talking about Tarhe's war. Um, it's going to be hard for us to not discuss the things that were going on uh, as Tarhe waged war against the Americans. Uh, that's why I decided to do a continuation of Tarhe because what Tarhe did in his, his time as chief before the Battle of Fallen Timbers, uh, he had a ally in his efforts by the name of Little Turtle. And Little Turtle was Mammy. And got it there, Robert. So Tarhe was identified as the leader of the nations, but <clears throat> at the same time, uh, we're going to have to take a look and at as, we, as I put all this together, there's just so much stuff here that to make it all make sense in a better light, um, next month we're going to have to talk about Little Turtle just a little bit uh, because Little Turtle and Tar Hay, uh, they were the two prominent and dominant chiefs at the time that brought absolute havoc to the brand new country called the United States of America. And we got to take a look at just a couple of the battles that they uh, participated in and actually uh, served as uh, stratagems and the, the chiefs that defeated uh, the United States Army in some pretty sound ways. But then I want to conclude next month on the peace that Tarhe is so well known for. Because if it wasn't for a man such as Tarhe, um, the war would have continued. And I have no doubt that the United States would have destroyed most of the nations. So Tarhe, uh, he definitely. Um, made some friends and enemies, even within our own people. Um, we were going to talk about Roundhead, and Roundhead was one of them. Um, but the peace that he made with the Americans after the Battle of Fallen Timbers saved the nations. I believe that. If it wasn't for Tarhe, it would have been an extreme loss of life. Uh, the Americans would have waged war with no restraints. So next month's going to be a little bit different. We're going to look at some, some difficult things to talk about. Hope everybody is okay with that because it's part of our history that we do have to acknowledge and we have to look at it from time to time and give honor to our men that stood and allowed us to be here today. It's very important to look at all the sides of history and not to try to narrow things down. Absolutely. And if you know me, I'm not going to hold nothing back. We're going to tell it like we know it to be. It's what we want. Yeah. Can you throw the uh, sources up again, too, please? <laughs> um, yeah, there's going to be more that I will add to this. Sure. Um, I, okay. I admit I was tweaking on this as early as five o'clock this morning because there's mm -hmm. stuff that I put in and stuff that I took out and things that I added and things that I didn't feel was appropriate. So uh, before I send uh, the slides to Kim and Josh, I'm going to add a lot more sources in here. Okay. Uh, these are some of the. Uh, the more prominent sources, uh, more details I'm going to add in here that give a little bit more reading pleasure for anybody that's so willing. And there's a lot more that's going to come. Wonderful. I appreciate everything you're doing here. Um, it, it's an effort, but to share this and let our this this is who we are uh, we have to know this it gives us a foundation for our own um, not just personal identity but national identity uh, looking back at someone like Tarhe 
um, we've looked at Tarhe, we've looked at um, um, Kondorok, uh, we looked at Nicholas, uh, we had a chance here to look at some of our women. Um, I wish we had more of knowledge on our women that we could share, because I've said it before, nothing that these men were capable of accomplishment could not have been done without the mothers and the aunts that first raised them to be the warriors that they became. And unfortunately, we have so much of our history that has been lost. It hasn't been preserved because they were just women. Mm -hmm. uh, from the perspective of the Europeans, women. ladies, you didn't count. You didn't add up to nothing. But what the Europeans could not understand is for the accomplishments of Smilek Tarhe, it could not have been done without his mama. It was his mama that raised him to be who he became. And without her and his aunts, I wish we knew more about Tarhe's mom, about his aunts. Those are the women that made him who he is. Mm -hmm. And that's a big portion of our, of our traditions, of our history, of our, our foundation as who we are as a people that we just don't have that I wish we did. So next week, well, next week, next month, we cannot do this weekly. It would it'd kill me. Uh, but next month, um, more on Tarhe. Hope everybody's okay for that. Amen. Yeah, yes. That would be awesome. Okay. Yeah, so. Shame for all your hard work, Lloyd. Oh, you're welcome. We're all grateful for all you do. So, if nobody has any more thoughts, comments, or whatever, um, I think we're done, unfortunately. Unless we just want to sit here and talk, uh, we can. Stop that recording, maybe, Josh, because most people out there just don't want to hear us ramble. I'm going to slip away. I have some work I need to get done. It's still early here in California, and I've got um, a grant I'm working on, and I got a homework assignment from them just before class started, so I better get to that. So to all of you, it's good to see you and to know that we have so many good relations out there across the great turtle, our mother. So bye all. See you another time. Bye -bye. See you next month. Oh, no. I as well need to go. I'm exhausted after today. So <laughs> I did my 12 hours with the student and I'm a little tired myself. Yep. Okay. Thank so you. I'll see everybody next month. Bye. Don't forget, Bye -bye. September's coming up pretty quick. Very quickly, and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, indeed. Okay, I'll be sending you some stuff, Josh. Okay. Okay. Ho hopefully, you're okay with me using you as an example. I I honestly walked away, and right when I came back, I heard Josh. I'm like, oh, dear. And yeah. <laughs> We, we talked about you just a wee bit, so it's all good. It's all good. Great. Great. Glad I can be made an example of then. Yeah, you, you are an example. Okay. Well, everybody have a good night. Night. Have a good night, Lloyd. You too.